Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I think, uh, I think a few more people will be coming a little bit later, but uh, it's also, it's like in the middle of the session between summer and, uh, and the end of the semester, so it's a, it's a bit of a time when people are, are perhaps off and, and doing various things, but we have a colloquium series here that we worked really hard on in the last year, and we've had fantastic speakers uh, telling us about very interesting things going on, everything from the applications of supercomputing to um, uh, sensor networks to uh, software environments and so on. And today we have, I'd say, who's uh, someone who justifiably would be called the world leader in the development and applications of optical networks um, around the world. I've known Case a lot for, I don't know how long, 20 years or so, I'd say. We, we kind of got to know each other through various meetings. Um, he's also a very entertaining person, um, when people are giving demos, like I would give demos at supercomputing of things like black hole colliding and, and, and things like that, Case gave a demo called Dead Cat, okay, <laughs> which I will never forget. <laughs> so, uh, so Case is going to give us a very interesting talk, I'm sure. Um, he runs uh, a lot of operations around optical networking. He's been involved in grid computing, one of the leaders of the, uh, the old uh, grid forum. Uh, he's in the Research Data Alliance, the RDA. Uh, he's involved in, in many projects in Europe. In fact, I, I have a, I printed off his web page, and they're just like, you know, pages and pages of projects. So I, I urge you to take a look at his web page to learn more about him. He's also a full professor at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, if you look at, uh, at the glyph map, which in fact, uh, some of you I know were directly involved in producing, um, you'll find that there is like the, probably the, the most networks per, per square centimeter of that glyph, glyph map come right out of Amsterdam, and Case is one of the key reasons for that. So he's going to tell us uh, about optical networking and, and data and, uh, and how they come together. Thanks. So at, <clears throat> thanks for this uh, very kind introduction, and I'm honored to uh, be allowed to uh, give a presentation here. So uh, I hope to entertain you then for the next hour. Uh, so you put the bar very high. Indeed, uh, that cat demo, I'm <coughs> sorry, I didn't uh, know that you would mention it, otherwise I would have put the slide in. But the dead cat demo was actually a very uh, interesting uh, story, which I then will start with now, which is nowhere in the slide. So uh, we had uh, made uh, together with the group of Peter Sloot a demonstration where uh, there would be uh, an, uh, an, uh, a cat in an, uh, on, on uh, a preserved cat in a bottle. So on, uh, on formaldehyde. And uh, that would have been put in a CAT scanner in a hospital, totally 3D uh, scanned. So that whole model was in the supercomputer. And then we envisioned that you would use a tablet from which you, you uh, knew the position of the tablet, you know the positions of the eyes of the person who is using that. You use cameras uh, to observe that, and you had these trackers. And then you would virtually look in a plane half a meter behind the tablet in the object. So the real object would be there, but you would send the coordinates to the supercomputer and that would send back the images on the tablet uh, so that virtually you were looking in the, in, in, the, in the object. So you can imagine for health applications that you have the patient there and you have the doctor with his hand out and he needs to take off one of the legs and that he uses that to look in his data which leg is actually the correct one to amputate. I had a just small uh, plastic uh, example. So then we wanted to show this at supercomputing and so uh, we had a problem that we couldn't get this, uh, this uh, dead cat uh, in the bottle which was actually from the historic museum was actually in alcohol and there was no way we could get that on the plane. So um, <clears throat> the first problem was that the whole shipment arrived. So Peter Sloot had called it a highly interactive distributed uh, simulation for something like that. Eh? And uh, Schrodinger's cat. And I said, you know, this is too, way too complicated. We just call it the dead cat demo. <laughs> so that was on the crate. And there was no way we got it on the supercomputing floor because we do not allow dead animals on the <laughs> supercomputing floor. There is not a dead animal in it, actually, because we were not allowed to take the bottle on the plane. So what we ultimately did was just an empty bottle with a stuffed cat into it. So my story then goes that in presentations I suggested, you know, uh, we first uh, thought about renting a car and then scoring a cat in the suburbs of Pittsburgh to put in the bottle. But you never know if the cat you score is the same as what you have in the model in the computer, so we abandoned that idea. 
And then, of course, I got people, you can't do that with live cats. Of course, I love cats. I actually <laughs> wouldn't do that. But nobody got the joke. So that was a funny story. But just the name Dead Cat Demo made that it got widely known. If you would have kept the original name, everybody would have forgotten by now. That's the whole point. So, <coughs> yeah, so indeed I'm a full professor at the University of Amsterdam since about five years, running a group system and network engineering, and uh, quite a big group nowadays, about uh, 50 different people, or about 30 FTE, if you uh, call it. And those people are listed here, more or less, and the font size is proportional to the amount of publications uh, they have, so you see <laughs> a little bit uh, the... the, the uh, relative importance. So what I want to talk with you about uh, today is uh, smart cyber infrastructure for big data processing. Um, <coughs> so the Dutch Academy, uh, um, the King's Academy of Sciences, that's how it is called, kind of way, the King's Academy of Sciences, uh, brought out a report a few years back uh, with what are the big questions society has for the science to solve in different domains, and that goes also about energy and about water and about uh, uh, other sciences. But for computer science and mathematics, they came up also with a chapter of just three pages, where they say information technology is now uh, permeating all aspects of public and commercial, social and personal life. Um, so the IT has become completely indispensable for, for, for society. However, to guarantee the reliability, quality of constantly bigger and more complicated IT, we need answers to some fundamental questions. And those fundamental questions uh, were uh, listed also in that. And I thought that's a good starting point. Well, we were doing lots of this uh, research already for, your, for, for ages. But to list them here and to see where we are really uh, ourselves uh, working on. So here you see those questions. Can we describe and analyze complex information systems effectively? Uh, how do we combine various different systems, uh, which is now, you would say, yeah, that's the grid and so on. But how do you fundamentally do that, and how is that evolving in the current world? How can we design systems in which separate processes cooperate efficiently via networks and so on? So in this list, you see a number of things which all of us are actually already doing, listed and uh, gives a kind of uh, a foundation for uh, the research, computer science research, uh, what, what we are doing. So if I look to my own group, the mission statement is, can we create smart and safe data processing infrastructures that can be tailored to diverse application needs? And as you notice, this quite a big group, so we can also cover a number of essential niches which need to be researched. So we look at capacity, uh, uh, items, so where uh, speed is the name of the game, uh, capabilities, programmability, you now know that everything becomes programmable, uh, uh, software-defined networking, software-defined storage, uh, even software-defined computing, while well, everybody would say software-defined computing, are you nuts? Well, we have now an EU project, which actually is software-defined computing, where you uh, program um, uh, advanced uh, hardware boards to put there an, infra an uh, instruction set in which is optimized for spe specific uh, domain specific uh, languages. So DSLs are now becoming a fashion where you have uh, languages which are tailored to different domains and then you want the compilers to very efficiently compile to, uh, to, to those specialized uh, infrastructures. Um, but SDX, where X stands for different kinds of infrastructure, is now hot. Security, uh, in uh, my group we have uh, research done in the past also about key identifiability, for example, if you anonymize uh, public health data or any other data. Um, but yeah, you get bits and pieces of information then from different data sources. If you put that together again, what are the medical models behind that to re-identify people? Uh, if you know if somebody is man or woman, then you can already, uh, you have 50%. And so if you know the postal code, then you, get, you, you can zoom in on in which group is this subject actually living until that is one, and then you know who it is. So we have studied uh, those uh, questions. 
Um, we look at security of uh, processing of data and distribute environments, uh, uh, the, the integrity and privacy of that. Sustainability uh, is becoming a huge issue, uh, limited energy and so on, uh, and resilience, uh, if we are relying on it. So these uh, things are uh, more or less spelled out here. Bandwidth on demand, quality of service, uh, photonics, performance, uh, architectures, GPUs, the programmability, and so on. So you see here that uh, subdivided. Um, so I want to zoom in on some of these aspects. I don't want to go over all the research uh, our group is doing in the entire, because that uh, takes too long. And on some parts, I'm also not myself the core expert. Capacity. Uh, so what are we doing here? So everybody knows, of course, the Atlas detector, which is probably as big as this building, a five-story building uh, and 30 meters in all directions. So these are huge, uh, huge uh, beasts. Uh, you can uh, compare that also with uh, the persons here. So this is really um, large. Um, and the amount of data these uh, detectors are uh, producing um, is always told to us that that is huge. Yeah? So the amount of data which ultimately needs to be processed are multiple gigabytes per second, and that is then distributed to a number of centers of the world. And that seems to be a very big data problem. However, there are also slides like these out there. You can find them from Intel, what happens in an internet minute. And so they collect it for a number of different uh, applications, the amount of data that's going over the internet and that is somehow being processed or transported or uh, you know what. For example, YouTube, every uh, minute there are 30 hours of video uploaded to YouTube. So don't try to watch it all, you lose at the start. But, uh, uh, and actually, I don't know if everything is really worth watching. But uh, these are huge amounts of data. Um, Google also. So if you look in the amounts of data, which is out there, then you see uh, the amount of business email which is going around here. At the bottom you can find uh, the thousands of petabytes and the hundreds of petabytes and so on. And LEC is this big, but the Google index is like this. Facebook uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, way bigger than, than what LEC does. In another uh, capacity, I'm also one of the uh, founding members of uh, Digital Cinema Cinegrid, and we work uh, with Hollywood. And one of the requirements for Hollywood currently is, since movies are all uh, nowadays taken digitally, uh, they do 4 and 8K uh, cameras, then they process all the data. Cinegrid is about using scientific methods of data processing, but apply that in this uh, cinema world. So they, uh, the Academy of Motion Picture came up with, uh, with the point, well, uh, the movies that can theoretically make it to um, uh, Oscars, so about 600 per year, all the digital material, we would love to save for at least 200 years. 200, eh? So you try to read the floppy from 20 years ago, but they want to keep it for 200 years. And one movie nowadays generates uh, about uh, 200 to 800 uh, terabyte of data. So the movie, what they ultimately distribute, is, uh, is uh, about uh, a few hundred gigabytes, what they show if they do it uncompressed. Um, but uh, the total amount with stills and intermediates and so on. So if you want to save that for 200 years, for 600 movies per year, then you know, LAT is really a very minor uh, problem. It is the subtitles in the movies, so to say. Um, so what do we do in research uh, regarding networks and uh, advanced networks? If we look at the problems of how networks are developing, um, we see three axes. So there's one axis where the amount of data which is going around becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, these are the really big flows, LHC flows for uh, the flows for uh, astronomy, uh, for Earth observation and so on, or also in society. You see also some big flows uh, coming across, although they are mostly going over private networks, but uh, also hitting the internet, the big data uh, flows. You have an axis where you see way more real-time applications, so these are... Uh, 
uh, streaming, television, uh, gaming, interactive uh, collaboration or Skyping and all these kind of things. And there is an axis where all uh, the small stuff is happening. So uh, Twitter, uh, YouTube, um, mailing and so on. So these are all very short-lived but huge amounts of, uh, of, of these. So the importance, the load for these three axes is uh, not that different. But if you look at the requirements, here you need speed and volume, here you need a deterministic behavior and a real-time behavior, <coughs> here you need scalability and you need uh, security and privacy and integrity. However, in the internet, we still use, uh, for big part, the same infrastructure to support these three very different, very different uh, axes. Um, so our research in the past 15 years, uh, as long as uh, Ed knows me, is about dealing with these problems. You have different kinds of users and you uh, want to differentiate your infrastructure in such an integrated way that you can cope with these three different axes. And everybody knows that infrastructure is uh, yeah, developing very rapidly for networks, uh, well, multi -color, multiple colors on fibers, uh, uh, photonic devices, so light is transported over, uh, over 15,000 kilometers without ever going from optical to electrical to optical. So the photonics devices have very, <coughs> have very much uh, advanced in the last uh, 15 uh, years. Uh, we are now talking about 400 uh, gigabit uh, waves in, uh, in, in spectrum space of 200 gigahertz on, on these fibers and then having about 100 to 200 of these channels, so about uh, 20 terabit per fiber is now, over multiple co colors, is now feasible. Um, and you have nowadays uh, even uh, hollow fiber. Does anybody know why you would uh, want to build hollow fiber? It is 100 times as expensive uh, than normal fiber, but uh, you know, hollow fiber, that is a special crystal structure which acts for light as if it is vacuum. Well, that has to do with uh, speed of light and trading, flash trading. So also in Amsterdam, we are in contact with a flash trading uh, business, so such a company which uh, tries to deal in, in microseconds and nanoseconds difference between different, uh, 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 what is it, uh, exchanges, so stock exchanges, and uh, to just trade on the pennies difference if they are just a little bit earlier than their uh, competition. So creep in between uh, tradings. There are some medical issues probably with that, but on the other hand, this is a huge business and they are really camping out every picosecond and nanosecond uh, they can get out of their uh, circuits. And there is this hollow fiber, a big Why thing. Why does hollow fiber have less weight? Because the speed of light in vacuum versus uh, light. This is physics. It's a vacuum inside. It's like a little vacuum tube. It acts tube. like a vacuum. I see. So it's going so inside and in the middle. So uh, it's 300 instead of 200. So yeah. you, you got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, uh, for, so the speed of light uh, as a rule of thumb for me at least is uh, the round trip time on fiber is one millisecond per uh, 100 kilometers. So uh, in, um, in uh, a hollow fiber you uh, then get uh, 150 kilometers per uh, okay. millisecond. So that makes for them, oh, that makes for them a huge difference. Yeah. Because uh, if you, I have talked with, they have given presentations in our system network engineering master. If you see what they tweak and do to get every, so they uh, stretching fibers and so on, that's really amazing. So, uh, um, yeah, and it's also fun to uh, watch it. So you can, uh, the Netherlands is about 200 by 300 kilometers. So I used to say that the Netherlands is two by three seconds, so uh, or six square milliseconds. <laughs> um, in wireless, you can now buy it in the shop, uh, gigabit wireless, uh, the AC uh, technology, so wireless is also enormously booming, and that is, uh, uh, of course, uh, the Internet of Things, or wearable, is uh, going to be a very big data source for us. Not everybody is uh, up to par with... Um, uh, wireless communications uh, yet, as you can see here, but they will get there. Um, another thing is uh, GPU cards uh, are enormously disruptive. You, of course, as a supercomputer center knows that. This is a top 500. You live by it. 
This is the bottom 500. You see that the bottom 500 is se seven years apart from the top 500. It's also interesting. And this is, this is now by now a slide of a few years old. But you see that the GPUs, given that is the gaming industry and everybody wants to do quick gaming, well, had actually a steeper line and was crossing here. And at this point, one GPU card was, uh, was approximately as fast, if you could use it, of course, as a uh, seven-year-old supercomputer. And then you got, of course, uh, put those uh, cards uh, in the system and uh, dimension it differently using the same amount of money. You jump to here. You have, of course, an efficiency factor, which you lose if you try to use GPUs, but you, you get them somewhere here. But you see that these are disruptive changes, just as in the past we have seen here also architectural disruptive changes. And now, of course, these GPUs are such a disruptive uh, change in uh, computing. The fun part is if you also start to look at what uh, storage per, uh, per, uh, per uh, yeah, square, ce square centimeters is not the correct uh, uh, unit, but per gigabyte is doing. So uh, the amount of data you can store per dollar, if you wish, is also thinking, but that is thinking with 14 months of uh, half time. Well, this is 18 months. So you know if you uh, divide one exponential by another, you, get, you are left with an exponential. So that actually tells us that data becomes uh, exponentially uncomputable. We collect way more data than we can actually compute. And I tell my students always that we need exponentially smarter students for exponentially better algorithms to cope with this problem. Um, <coughs> this is our kindergarten. This is uh, uh, the world, the glyph, the, so uh, a huge number of NRANs which put resources together for researchers and also for uh, computer scientists like me who research actually the instrument and not necessarily use the instrument for another domain, but we, this is our research topic, is uh, <coughs> where we uh, test out and work on uh, uh, new algorithms and so on for distributing data, transporting data, uh, learning about uh, what resources are there, connecting them, and so on. And some of that I would like to talk about. But as Ed already said, uh, we are in an interesting place in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, the leadership of Case Negus and Surfnet and others uh, in the Netherlands uh, foreseeing these new big uh, applications coming up and that you needed specialized infrastructure and that you really need to get the telcos out of the way and get down to the fiber and make fiber so as low as possible available for the science to use uh, was really a deal breaker in the last, month, in the last uh, decennium, in the last 10 years, to make uh, big science possible. And those hubs were basically here in Illinois, in Chicago, in the Netherlands, uh, in the northern net countries. Uh, you have a lot of, we saw a lot of leadership, Canada, of course, with Canary. And uh, that uh, made that in the last 10 years, Netherlight, uh, just across the street from my laboratory, uh, grew out to a hub of scientific data. I think that a uh, huge, so large part of the science data in Europe is passing through uh, Amsterdam through Netherlight as an uh, optical exchange for uh, big flows. <coughs> and my group has actually dark fiber directly into that point, so we have about 48 uh, fibers and so on, so we can do, if we wish, all kinds of experiments in that field. Um, one of the things we also were the first in is when the uh, first 100 gigabit for science was uh, 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 deployed uh, two years ago, uh, the ANA 100, uh, it ended up in Amsterdam and actually also in the Terena conference in Maastricht, which was in that same year, and it was uh, experimented also with our group to, to be used and so on and debugged. Um, this is how we do science. We go to a conference and then we eat the cookies and then we use the napkin to make a plan, <laughs> which in this case is actually uh, a plan which I uh, devised uh, with Ralph Fischer from Nordinet with, uh, uh, over tea. Like, wouldn't it be nice if uh, I would have a computer in Amsterdam given these new photonic devices at the university which uh, spreads out light and you only deal with the light and only with the color, you don't look in, inside it, you don't look at V-lens or whatever, but you transport the light 
to appear at the university in uh, Stockholm. So alien light transport uh, through all these different kingdoms or domains. Uh, so this is a super DMZ, if you wish. Um, so we did draw that a little bit here from, oh yeah, you would have two systems here and then here an DWDM going in a separate spectrum over this Alcatel fiber to Hamburg and there we just bypass the Ethernet switch and so on. We signed both, this is my sign and this is his sign. And this is actually the poster uh, of how the experiment was engineered, was implemented and executed. Uh, we did also these kind of experiments with 40 gig and uh, uh, between uh, UVA and Copenhagen using a uh, whole photonic system over CERN where three different optical systems were included. But it was pure photonics from CERN, so, uh, I, so I must confess, so here, here uh, one color came in, in uh, CERN but then it went to another color, but this color was transported over this system to crossing six countries in about uh, 27 milliseconds, so it's uh, 2,700 kilometers of fiber. Two different optical vendors, so this was uh, Nortel Siena, and this was an Alcatel system, but we just transported the light end-to-end -end and uh, experimented with multi-core systems, and of course uh, the application iPerf, to transport iPerf uh, uh, data from one to another and to experiment with it. So here is, uh, this was actually, this is a movie from the actual monitoring that you see that uh, the transmit and receive uh, data. But the things we learned actually was that uh, it, you really have to dig into the architecture of the servers to get the maximum uh, performance. So for example, we had 48 core machines. Now 48 core machines are not the best communication machines because they are way more all their architectures way more optimized to deal with all these uh, cores than to get it to the network. But what we also found that it made a difference, not all the chips are equal and not all the cores within the chip are equal. So depending on which chip your communication process ends makes up to 20% difference in the amount of data you can transport. Um, because uh, here was the Ethernet controller, the 40 gigabit Ethernet controller, but this chip is closer to that. For this chip, it had to bridge or cross over to get there, and uh, within the chip, the 12 cores per chip, it was also apparently different, so we did the total map. And here you see that pattern of four, and uh, with a repetition of four and uh, 12. So what this teaches us is, even if you do these kind of things, you really need to architect and to map your application very optimally to the uh, infrastructure. And we published uh, this work, so if you want to learn more, then uh, I can point you. Another uh, topic uh, I would like to delve into with you a little bit is capabilities. This is, so the previous was capacity. We have now also a research line on GPU programming and craft processing on GPUs, but I didn't uh, discuss that now here. So capabilities. Again, if we look at this entire map, note that there is not a single organization who owns this entire map. These are all, it's a kind of jamboree of uh, different resources put together in, in, and uh, connected. <clears throat> but there are many different organizations who own and operate different pieces of this uh, map. But still, a scientist does not want to know that. He, he wants a connection from, uh, for example, here uh, an antenna uh, receiving imaging f from a, for a one-time event from Sat Saturn or Jupiter and want that transmitted and processed in a data processor here at Astral, and that actually happened. You have a question, or you are stretching your... We're building radio telescopes in the south of Africa. Yeah? Lack of it sticks out. It sticks out. There are uh, optical systems. I have those maps. Uh, um, there are now these uh, photonic systems. I'm, oh, sorry, I need to correct. <laughs> so there are these systems uh, around Africa, which then peek in into Africa. You know those. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> uh, they are not on this map, but you are right, and uh, you, you also know that part of SCA will be here, and they are discussing another part here, and then you would think about how do you do this. So the map, the map implies that there's not this kind of body of 
optical and network researchers in South Africa with the, with the kind of resources to get those kinds of links? Is that, is that it's all commercial? Is that, what, is that the implication? No, yeah, it is, well, typically all those submarine cable systems are uh, commercial, but uh, you know, the NRAMs uh, tender and get uh, 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 either wavelengths or what they are also trying to tender for in the near future is to get a spectrum band on these uh, yeah. fibers and then work with your own photonics or somehow to get uh, to get uh, the capacity uh, done there, but uh, this is not this is uh, the glyph map. These are the lines which are there, which uh, the scientists uh, also which the NRANs have. There are, of course, and you can find them online. The maps of what cable systems are there now. Uh, I have somewhere the pointers if you wish, but you can find them. And there are many uh, there, and there are also research links now uh, there, but they are probably not in the glyph uh, community. Maxine can say more. Yeah. Yeah, that's also true. This is, uh, that's but that's not the point of this slide. The slide, uh, the point of this slide is that, the point of this slide is that this is a complicated map. It is owned and operated by different organizations. We all have different technologies, different speeds, and different attributes uh, on which they decide forwarding decisions on. So what we actually are looking into is, can we build a TomTom -tom for such a map so that you can find your routes through it for depending on where you want to go? So uh, these systems are very complex. Many of you know these kind of pictures uh, from supercomputing where Cynet builds uh, an infrastructure and you see um, you don't need to interpret it but uh, at this point, but you know these are complex uh, systems. Uh, this is a map also five or ten years old from different institutes connecting in all kinds of different ways to SCSD and call IT square. These are complex uh, things with all kinds of different apparatuses connected by different technologies all together to different uh, places. And so how do you get a grip on these kind of infrastructure such that not a human needs to do all the connectivity and all the setup, but that you can have a machine interpret all information base so that you can ask a machine questions like, uh, oh, I now want to have this data, process it there, and get me the histogram on this screen over there, make it so. They can do it in Star Trek, why can't we do it? So you need a kind of distributed information base uh, to support that. So what we uh, set out about eight years or 10 years by now, I think, to do is, uh, well, <clears throat> you have this LinkedIn or you have friends of a friend's uh, semantic networks where you uh, uh, um, express what the relationships <laughs> are between different parts, uh, your subject, predicate, object, and you can, an ob uh, object can be a subject of another one. And so you build these kind of relationships and these things already start to look awfully a lot like networks. So we were thinking, can we make an ontology where we describe the different parts of networks and, uh, and then make schemes of that so that we can describe these complex infrastructures. So that became the network description language uh, which uh, started at the UVA. Uh, which also went in the grid uh, as NML, Network Mo uh, Modeling Language, and which is now used in NSI, Network Services Interface, uh, to exchange topologies to do pathfinding on. And the pathfinding is then, of course, a uh, uh, different thing. So here you see uh, the description in RDF of, uh, of, 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 of a piece of network, including uh, a MEMS device. Uh, switch, a glimmer glass uh, switch. But um, what we also can uh, do, and we worked on that and uh, have that in the system, is that you can do multi-layer uh, network. So we can work in a certain layer and describe the topology, what is connected to what, by what, and given that it is web-based, uh, um, every domain can make its own NDL file for its own infrastructure, but you can point from the one to the other, just like in normal web pages. Like, okay, this link goes to another domain, to Starlight or to, and there you can find the NDL file, how it stitches further. So you can also make a web of these, uh, these uh, information bases. 
But the other thing is we also devised ways to jump from layer to layer. So if you are on an IP layer and you want to jump to an Ethernet layer and reason on an Ethernet layer or on an SDS or on the fiber layer, on the color or on the wireless, that we have adaption operators so that you adapt from one to the other and then go on. So the basically this becomes a multi-layer routing protocol. And uh, we have all kinds of algorithms and generic primitives how to uh, navigate through these, uh, through these uh, descriptions. Um, so we have an INDL ODF spec which uh, uh, describes uh, this for networks, but there's no, and it is used in, uh, uh, NML is used also in NSI to uh, exchange topologies and currently we have projects with European uh, networking to uh, uh, work on uh, topology exchanges. This is how it looked like at Glyph in, in 2013. We just grabbed uh, out of the NML space uh, what is now the connectivity, and you see here the exchanges and the different VLANs and connect connections uh, between them. And then you can ask a computer to reason about if you need connections to set up and tear down links, and they were continu continuously doing that in the demos back then. But it doesn't, the whole point now is, and the crux is, it doesn't need to end with network elements, because for the computer, when it is, when it is interpreting these uh, semantic files, these uh, IDF files, that uh, uh, subject is connected to an object, <coughs> um, doesn't make any difference if you are talking about this computer is connected to that network port, or uh, this uh, port goes to that computer, goes to this disk, and goes to that content. So you can stage on, you, your knowledge does not end at the network edge. You can describe uh, compute clusters, you can describe storage, you can describe scenic grid resources, and that's exactly what we did here. So although you might think that that are my initials, <laughs> no, at the Cinecrypt uh, description language describes cameras, describes screens, describes uh, transcoders, and so on. So you get then an application-aware network or a network-aware application. You have an information layer where you can reason about different kinds of connections of, uh, of infrastructure. And the whole point is if in semantic space two different things have a relation, then you know that in physical space, they will be compatible. It will not be an Ethernet port in a fiber connector, for example. No, it will be, it will be uh, compatible because otherwise they wouldn't have that relationship. So it allows to uh, map a problem to a physical inter, uh, infrastructure which is uh, compatible. Um, it allows, uh, this information modeling allows us also uh, to connect infrastructure to services and to have that bridge in semantic space and allow computers to, uh, to, um, to reason about that. We have published a lot of this work, so if you wish to learn more about how these things are done, uh, there are pointers here. The slides will be available at the end of the talk. And we have demonstrated this at various places, which via my homepage or via our page you can also find. Sustainability. Um, is uh, quite an uh, important uh, problem. Every morning if I step in my car, I can type I want to go to the lab as if I wouldn't know where it is, but the TomTom -tom gives me the option for the fastest route, the eco route, the shortest, uh, avoid motorways or walking. But this is interesting. So I can actually say to the routing model, do me, an energy savvy route because it doesn't matter if I'm 10 minutes uh, later, but uh, I want to be eco. But sometimes I need to be quickly there, so I want a faster route. Burn whatever you have to burn, but need to get there. Within cyber infrastructure, I don't have these buttons. I would love to have a button that uh, if I have a very big data processing task that I hand it over and say, well, you know, uh, do it uh, eco uh, when the sun shines in your collectors are working, or burn whatever you have to burn, but I need to answer tomorrow morning. So how can we get this kind of green scheduling? Can we build, uh, just like you know, in networking, we have, uh, we have persona. So we have a distributed system of seeing how flows are going through the entire infrastructure. So we, can we do a similar 
thing for, uh, for the green net. So can we build a green zona? So can we measure, can we model, and can we uh, distribute information such that while you are going through these maps, you can have also the information for, uh, uh, to schedule your applications in a green way. So we did all kinds of experiments. This is 802.3 AZ. These are Ethernet switches and network switches. Normally, you turn them on and boom, they use this energy. Uh, while in computing, you know, if, the, if you are not heavily computing, then the computer uses less energy. Networks are not yet a very um, uh, throughput uh, proportional. So the energy they use is not yet so good proportional to the amount of packs they are actually transporting. And this is uh, one effort there. Um, so we did all kinds of experiments uh, with different uh, schemes of bringing computing to data or data to computing given certain uh, uh, problems if it was more efficient one or the other way. Same for, um, we actually include data. Is the energy source at that uh, compute center more coal based or more renewable based? And so in that sense, you can fork in that information. But the message here is you can then have more attributes on which you decide how you uh, map your problem space. So I go a little bit quicker now. Uh, Terra thinking. Uh, if we look at uh, networks, so what constitutes terabit networking? Uh, if we take the parallel with computing, what makes a teraflop or a petaflop computer? There's not a huge number of PCs in one room. But the fact that you have uh, the programming model to uh, harvest all those multiplication cycles for your application is what makes it a petaflop computer, so that you have MPI and I don't know what all kinds of uh, libraries running on that. Uh, we have that also for, uh, for storage. You have that for uh, big screens, like Sage. Uh, sensors are uh, all kinds of things. So for terabit networks, we now start also to get these technologies, like overflow, software-defined networking, and so on. So what we did in Amsterdam was virtualizing networks down to the level that a subroutine just a small program represented network elements. <clears throat> we made those network elements where also computation was connected to available in Mathematica. We gave Mathematica a huge computational problem to solve and we gave it the subroutines where it could do parts of the calculation to solve that problem, including the, uh, how it was connected. And, what, and if you then let Mathematica reason about it, given the resources it has, and you say optimize, and then around that solve, Mathematica comes up with the optimal topology of all the resources it has to solve the problem, and then actually also solves it. So it gives just the answer of the numerical problem. And if you think about this, take a step back, what you have done here is make networks part of the programming model of your application. And that is a new step compared to a previous, where you just uh, had a network as some yeah, slow thing beneath there, where you didn't have influence. And we have published this work also. Um, one of the things what we do is uh, having that same uh, abstraction of networks, uh, use uh, um, touch tables and so on, to have networks which are partly living in the cloud and partly physical. So here, uh, these black elements are, uh, are uh, true uh, uh, network elements, and these are created in VMs in, uh, in, in, in the network and allow us to build a completely scalable content delivery uh, network where with your finger you just draw lines and that will connect a video server with a screen. But what he can also do here, and he will do so after some more talking, is uh, draw an extra line from this node to another screen, and that will actually, actually instruct uh, the reason of this infrastructure. Oh, the guy probably wants multicast or broadcast from here, multicast to two different screens, and uh, implement that. So, and this here, the user interface is still a human who draws this on a an, uh, on an, uh, touch table. And what you see now is, that two screens are now doing the same movie. So um, he can do here also, given that this is a uh, network in the cloud where we have complete control on all the forwarding paradigms, we, we can build loops here. 
and the packets will actually really do that loop, while in real networks you will not be able to uh, uh, make that. But if you look under the hood what is happening, the packets are really going from this service twi twice over those links, and then it has no use useful application in that sense, but it shows you the power of uh, virtualized uh, networks. Another thing is we have here a Mathematica system uh, instructed that the network and the computing should always be two connected. So Mathematica is observing if uh, the requirements we have for this network is, are always fulfilled. And then with the mouse we can kill links. And what Mathematica does is it says, oh, I sense that uh, I'm not fulfilling the topology requirements anymore. And then it seeks new, new routes to, set, uh, to, to satisfy the connectivity requirements again. And it uses the topology reasoning uh, intelligence in Mathematica to do that. So, the, so you reuse basically the smartness of Mathematica for a certain problem in your, uh, in your uh, cyber infrastructure. So the last part of this talk is about uh, more the smart part, part of the networks. Uh, what scientists uh, typically want is show me, be, for example, uh, this movie on that tile display using a green infrastructure. Uh, uh, but that spawns a lot of questions like, uh, where is this movie existing? Uh, uh, do I need recoding and reprocessing to get it in the correct format for that tile display? And it needs apparently deterministic green infrastructure. But the consumer doesn't want to know this, the scientist. Uh, they take a beer out of the refrigerator and the beer is cool and they don't need to know anything about the fluid dynamics and how the beer got cold. They, it is just a utility. So nowadays, um, we have come fairly far. So these are these different types of infrastructure, sensor storage, nets, uh, supercomputers, grids, clouds, uh, 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 um, visualization. And nowadays, we have a whole uh, ecosystem of libraries and abstractions, how we can program these infrastructures, how we can get information out of it. So the big challenge is now in this space to make the reasoners so that you get that kind of high level abstraction, that you can tell the system what you want. You do an intent-based computing, just like you have intent-based uh, networking. You say, I, I want that data, histogram there, make it so. Um, so if you look how that works, um, doing science, you know, this pyramid is going from data to information to knowledge and then to wisdom and eternal happiness. In the ICT to enable science on this side, we virtualize it using XML, RDF, RSpec and all the kinds how we can virtualize it. We can use all or semantic uh, techniques or machine learning techniques to reason about what uh, is best, then you have schedulers and orchestration to act, and then, tada, you have your, uh, your uh, system. The scientists, the, the people where we work for, in some sense, uh, if you wish, the domain scientists, live up here. They don't want to know all these kind of details. What they want is a kind of magic data carpet, as I call it. They want to have a kind of scientific Google for data. Wouldn't it be nice to combine this data with that data? And then I can do my science. So uh, 10, 20 years ago, uh, your, everybody needed to have a lot of knowledge about the infrastructure they were using. But it gets more and more abstracted away. And there are a lot of our developments and research happening in this space now. Yeah, here's a bit the timeline of where we were worked on, the green semantic frameworks. We start with ATM and Sonnet and all the connections, AAA, uh, multi-domain authorization, light passes, uh, network uh, management. Some of these things we were leading in or uh, very heavily involved. Some things uh, happened uh, elsewhere, scenic grid, programmable networks. I talked about this. So if I advance this timeline, then you see here the sustainable internet. You see here cognitive networks and clouds, the virtualized uh, uh, networks, uh, making networks similar as computing uh, is, is done already, <coughs> making that uh, virtualized the good old trucking of TCP, but we want machine learning and so on so that I can build this I want Internet 3.0. And then here I will retire and live on behind the flowers. 
<laughs> so what are recent grants? What is, uh, where is our group actually living from? Because I have quite a big group nowadays. So last week we scored two different EU projects, uh, Edison, Education for Big Data, Intensive Science. Uh, Yuri Demchenko in my group is there, the lead. This, uh, we would love to work also with you guys because uh, curricula for big data processing on these infrastructures is really key. Teach the next wave of uh, researchers. We uh, scored a project on uh, virtual laboratories across Europe. Uh, the programming uh, for that, she means a whole research uh, um, senior in my group is uh, leading that. SANET, uh, trust among domains in creating the services. Yeah. <clears throat> Why can I rent a rental car here at uh, Chicago? Um, using my credit card. So what is the whole trust system to make available to me a rental car somewhere else where they just don't know me and don't, are not necessarily able to trust me? What are the underlying mechanisms which, which make these kind of things possible? What for kind of or organization do you need? And how do you implement that on the technical level? That is the SANET, uh, uh, distributed uh, cyber infrastructure, observe, control, and have a trust uh, frame uh, group uh, under that. Um, so that is this, uh, basically. Uh, and some parts I showed, touch table, uh, um, computable, computed uh, orchestration. We actually showed a demo of a baby step on this uh, pass uh, earlier this week. This is really hot from the press. This is at the offices of uh, Siena in Ottawa. You see here uh, a few people. So uh, we uh, demonstrated uh, a part of this virtualized uh, cloudified uh, network uh, there. We got a grant in uh, environmental sciences, so data exchange between uh, environmental science is a big project, 20 million. Our share is uh, about a million, but we control actually 5 million, the data seem from it, which is all about data exchange between different uh, uh, environmental sciences. Uh, I will skip over this uh, a bit because uh, uh, of time. Uh, switch is a uh, grant we got and we are actually leading is about a deterministic uh, programming environment in the cloud. So uh, build applications with this deterministic behavior in the cloud. And we have a number of other uh, grants like uh, Cyclone, which is an intercloud. So we have internet exchange, but we now also need cloud exchange <laughs> paradigms. Information complexity. Uh, IDEPT uh, is uh, more on embedded processor, but I need totally not talk about that. And uh, this is then that software defined computing uh, uh, thing. So this brings me to my uh, one but last slide. If I look to our field, the constant, uh, the only constant factor is change. Yeah. So in the 50 years it took physicists to find one particle, the Higgs. Uh, we came from assembler Fortran, COBOL. Uh, VM, RSX11M, Unix, and so on via Smalltalk, uh, TCP IP, WWW. Uh, you see, we, um, Facebook, Twitter are now the big things, SDN, data, 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 or big data, and apps. So every few years in our metier, in our job, there are very many changes. So uh, there's never a dull day on the job. And so we are now living in a world where DDoS attacks are destroying banks and Bitcoin. So we are really in the need of a safe, smart, resilient, sustainable infrastructure. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you. So. so we, I think we have about four minutes. I think we have a kind of a hard stop at, at noon here, right? So a few minutes for questions uh, and then uh, Case and Maxine also is here for the day, uh, are around for the afternoon, so if, and there are various meetings. So if so, any of you are not on the schedule but would like to get in, because there are a lot of interesting things here. So I love this presentation, by the way. It just reminds me of a lot of the things that I used to do when I was very active in, in doing demos and pushing the edges of technology, and, and we're working hard at NCSA to kind of start driving those kinds of things as well. So we'd love to talk to you about how we might work together on some of these things. So Happy, any, uh, any quick questions for Case now? To do that, and if you go to sc.dalat.net, which I do here live, 
since uh, Eduroam is a marvelous thing. This is uh, our effort that we did at uh, supercomputing in Louisiana. And uh, apart from that, you see uh, live pictures of uh, what happened. You actually will find uh, below here, you will find posters which we had, but you will find also screen grabs from uh, the demonstrations uh, what we did and the material behind it from those demonstrations. So uh, application uh, driven networks and so on, you find here at the bottom. You, so you can find the slides and uh, uh, the papers. Questions, sorry, because uh, otherwise I give a second presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe. Interested in? Um, are they interested in, in some of these SDN co type concepts or some of the more adaptive networking concepts, um, or is it something that you have to feel like you have to go out there and, and drum up that interest? And so uh, I didn't get the very first part of the question. What is your sense of the interest in the from the funding agencies? Because you're talking about grants at the very end. So uh, in some uh, sense, uh, funding agencies are some, sometimes driving this because they drive always new things. And whenever there's a new acronym, they uh, support it. But then you ask yourself, what is then the fundamental new thing under that acronym that makes it worth doing research and uh, driving it? Um, yeah, um, it is actually a good question because one of the reasons I am now here and I am traveling through the US and talking with different parts, I see in the Netherlands and in Europe budgets shrinking or they are given more to industry and then they tell us and the researchers, uh, well, you, we will double the money if you get it back from industry. So you have to work with industry to get uh, uh, matching funding from the Science Foundation and then do your research. But then you become industry driven and industry is not always uh, the party who wants to do really risky research using SDN or new technologies in the center and so on. So it is a challenge. You see shrinking budgets. Politicians want us to be more driven by industry, but industry is not our way. They are for the next quarter and for the short term, while we also want to do the long term uh, uh, research. So. There is a huge tension, and uh, funding is uh, shrinking. I notice uh, that, and that's also one of the things uh, I have to write a uh, report for, or participate in writing a report for SURF in the Netherlands, which is uh, the cyber infrastructure. So the funding is shrinking in, in Europe. Um, are you working uh, in collaboration with any of, funding opportunities yeah, shrinking with them? or uh, differentiating. You need to get it from other, from other sources. So it is a challenge. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, I just throw out one, one quick idea about funding for not so much for the big projects, but for demonstration projects, if you want to sort of push the edge of some kind of a technology, particularly in the networking space, uh, and then demonstrate something that then might lead to larger funding. We have a lot of uh, teams around the country that use NCSA facilities, either um, through the Exceed project, through uh, the PRAC teams and others that use the Blue Waters project and, and, and other kind of smaller projects that we have here, um, they're typically funded by NSF to do their science and then they're users of the facilities here. And so uh, I think a fairly easy path to getting some interesting dynamics for demonstrations would be to talk to some of those large users and have them go to their program staff at the NSF and ask for supplements to their grant, because supplements are fairly easy to get, to show that they could do something amazing with the remote facilities, and that always involves networking. And so it's something I talked a lot about with people at NSF. People like that idea, and I think it would be one easy way for us to, uh, to get some of this uh, thing uh, jump-started. So this is uh, one of the projects which we recently discussed, Sarnet, but notice that we do that together with KLM. So the airliner has problems with its IT infrastructure by DOS attacks and approaches us, and we approach then different agencies. So this is an example where we have industry involved, and we have more of these projects also within my group with industry inv involvement. Okay, well, let's thank Case again. Thank you.